okay okay welcome uh, everyone we will pray and we will go ahead with the class um i request one of us to lead in prayer and then we will get started Okay, maybe uh, either Dave or Thomas, because I can't see Arun connected to audio. Okay, Nana, okay. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this new day and this week, Lord Jesus. As we move ahead and learn, Lord Jesus, study, Lord God, uh, help all of us to understand, Lord Jesus. Those who have already joined into the still yet to join Lord Jesus help them to join in time as well, Lord Jesus, and help us understand and comprehend everything, Lord Jesus, so that we can be well equipped to do your ministry. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. So uh, in the last class, I remember we have touched on Hebrews chapter one, uh, and we saw Primarily the superiority of Christ, uh, the deity of Christ. We understood that he is greater than the angels and that the angels worship him. We also saw that he is the perfect representation of the father. Uh, we saw how there is a relationship of the father and the son uh, in the Trinity. But we also saw how uh, God has anointed the Lord Jesus. And when we talk about the anointing, there is the engagement of the Holy Spirit as well. So though we do not see the term Trinity in scripture, when we study scripture, the interaction of the Godhead introduces the Trinity to us. And then we went on to Hebrews chapter 2 uh, and we just began going over the scriptures there. We said that the writer calls us to take earnest heed of whatever has been said so far, the supremacy of the Lord Jesus, the fact that he is the son of God and that he is God. So uh, he is asking us to fix our eyes on that and give our complete attention to it uh, so, so that we don't drift away. And we saw that drifting away uh, is something that doesn't happen in a day, uh, it is something that progressively can happen to a believer. We understand the context of uh, Hebrews. We know that the writer was encouraging believers who were under persecution, going through tough times. Um, they were also placed in a time where there were alternate philosophies. So there were many reasons or why they might drift away. And the writer wanted to encourage them to hold on to their faith, to hold on to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if they didn't, the easiest way to fall away is to do nothing. Because as a believer and a Christian, we must have initiative all the time to do our part in faith to hold on to God. Now, it's not that God will let go of us. That's not the point. But you see, we are making ourselves vulnerable if we don't hold on actively to God. And that is why that initiative from a believer is so very important. If it's not there, then there is a drifting away which uh, happens. And that is very, very sad. Now, moving forward. I think verse 2 uh, onwards. Mm, so we're once again encouraged that we need to hold on to the word of the Lord Jesus. In verse 2, the author, he uh, points to the fact that the word brought about by angels um, receives when you heed that word, there is a reward. When you disobey that word, you no, know, there is 
a consequence now what is the word that is brought by angels you know some um, passages indicate that the word which was given to moses which is the uh, old covenant it is the law that also had a work of angels involved in it so that is why basically it's the law but then the engagement of angels is um, mentioned in certain places and that is why this writer he is saying that the covenant the old covenant you remember the old testament people who did not obey god's word you know they um, faced consequences so he's saying that if the word which is brought by angels has such an impact or an implication how much more if we neglect okay so greater salvation so jesus has brought a salvation and through his life he has um, spoken no, the the grandness of God. He has represented the Father really well, and He gave us salvation. And we are told that we must not neglect. And I I think I touched on this as well in the last class and said that when we don't value something, that's when we end up neglecting it. So we must understand what salvation means and the more we understand jesus the more we understand salvation it invites us to um, hold it precious to us so don't neglect it is what the writer is telling these uh, believers he goes on to say that the word which was spoken by the lord uh, and was confirmed to the writer and many others by those who heard him both god also bearing witness both with signs and wonders with various miracles and gifts of the holy spirit according to his own will so he verse 4 what he's saying is this word which has been spoken to us through the lord jesus is very precious it should not be neglected and this word is something that invites the engagement of god himself now how does god engage with the word we are told signs wonders miracles so whenever we preach god's word here is our expectation and here is our confidence that the genuine word of god will invite the work of the Godhead. Now God will then begin to work after you have spoken the word of God. So now what an encouragement it is for us. So we are never alone when we serve in the word of God. We, we are never alone when we proclaim the word of God. We are never by ourselves when we speak the word of truth. God comes in and he shows his glory. So uh, it is also said that when we preach God's word, we must make sure that we do our part to rightly divide the word of God and place it before people with the right understanding. When we place it before people with the right understanding, what can you expect? There will be testimonies of what? Of you know, healings, of deliverances, of life transformation, of provision. So, so many things that can happen in the listener or the hearer's life because the truth of God's word is being proclaimed so uh, never wonder what what will happen what if they don't recognize God even after I have preached the message what if they think that I am uh, out of my mind or what I'm saying is untrue here is our assurance Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 4 what does God do God works with signs, wonders, miracles once the word has been proclaimed. So the writer is saying that we have been given 
all these opportunities and privileges please don't neglect it this is so amazing that we can proclaim god's word and god works together with us so you know we are co-laboring with god in the ministry moving forward i'm at verse five now once again this passage it shows us about the manner in which god has created man how has god created man we are told what is man that you are mindful of him meaning in the earthly structure that god has given man the glory is different isn't it so the heavenly glory that god has it's so much greater so in that sense um, this passage is from psalm 8 and the writer is quoting it i think i told us that you will find many old testament passages quoted in the book of hebrews because the writer is targeting a jewish audience primarily and they already know scripture so he's pointing out to psalm chapter 8 and he's saying that though man does not have that heavenly glory god why is it that you value him why is man precious to you so that shows us god's love to make man the center of his plan of redemption god did not come to save angels god did not come to save heavenly beings of course as a part of redemption even they are affected by what the lord jesus has done but the primary focus god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so when we read passages like this we are greatly encouraged that god cares for us and god loves us so much and then we are told uh, you have made him a little lower than the angels so when god created man here is the the position a little lower than the angels so does this mean that man is lower in the hierarchy but if you go back to hebrews chapter 1 it's quite clear that angels are ministering spirits you recall uh, hebrews 1 verse 14 it says that angels are here to aid the heirs of salvation or angels are here to help those who have inherited salvation therefore man is the one that angels are serving now keep that in mind and then read this verse you have made him that is man little lower than the angels so if angels are serving man how can man be lower than the angels the understanding so that is why we must let scripture interpret scripture so based on scripture we recognize that angels serve man but this line is talking about the the glory angels continue to have the heavenly glory but man is here on earth having the earthly glory which god has given him and that is why the statement seems like man is lower than the angels but it doesn't mean that it simply is referring to the difference in the kind of glory that the angels have and man has he continues to say that man has been crowned with glory and honor and here is the next thing you set him over the works of your hands remember we've studied genesis 1 verses 26 and 27 about the dominion that god has given man so god gave man dominion over the works of his hands so once again man is the representative of god who also now carries delegated authority so that is the position of man man has been created with glory and honor and god has made him set him 
over the works of his hands and put all things in subjection under his feet so basically the um, the dominion that has been given okay now all things put in subjection under him he left nothing that is not put under him okay so continues to talk about the dominion but now we do do not yet see all things put under him but we see jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor but you know ultimately um we understand that you know everything though man has been given dominion over everything there there are you know certain things that he is not able to um, um you know does not have has not demonstrated dominion over but then jesus comes into the picture and the author calls our attention to jesus and says look at jesus you know but we see jesus who is the ultimate ruler and king we've already seen in hebrews 1 a beautiful description of the lord jesus where he's called as the the son of god the express image of god you know uh, yeah. so so the the word he upholds the world with the power of his uh, the word of his power so many things that we have seen about the lord jesus once again you know our attention is drawn to the lord jesus again it mentions about jesus that he was made a little lower than the angels so the same rule applies whenever we read a one off line or passage that gives us a certain meaning we have to ask the question what do other passages of the bible say is jesus lower than the angels go back to hebrews 1 we saw there that the angels worship jesus so how can jesus be lower than the angels basically what we are to being told is that the lord jesus put on humanity so he left behind his heavenly glory philippians chapter 2 is another passage that we can refer to he left behind his heavenly glory and he became a human being what did he do as a human being we are told he suffered death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of god might taste death for everyone so the lord jesus was sent or for man to become that perfect atonement price and we know that he suffered death now could he have suffered death could he have it says my taste death for everyone so that also tells us that according to the law of god you know there needs to be a sacrifice for sin so on behalf of everyone that has, has sinned if you recall the practices of the old covenant there would be a sacrifice made so that the sins of the people can be forgiven so that one sacrifice would affect others and in the same way there is this one man who is chosen to taste death for everyone the question is could the lord jesus have died if he had not put on humanity again going back to the old testament laws you really needed somebody who represented man you really needed a human being you know to pay the price for the sins of human beings and which is why we see that the lord jesus became a man why did he become a man no he was fulfilling the law of god in many ways so though man was created to rule and reign he needed a savior he needed a redeemer and so we see jesus who also became a man to suffer death for us okay so this is the understanding hebrews chapter 1 is about the deity of christ hebrews chapter 
is about the humanity of Christ. Isn't that beautiful? When we study about the person of the Lord Jesus, we say, you know, scriptures reveal to us that he was fully God and he was fully man. So Hebrews chapter 2 helps us with that understanding that he was fully man. Because if he was not a man, he could not taste death. But he was fully man, which is why he was able to taste death on behalf of everyone. Again, verse 10, it says, for it was fitting for him. Fitting for whom? Fitting for God. To do what? For whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory. Okay. So to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. So we are told that God chose or decided for the Lord Jesus to become a human being and do what? Here are the things that the Lord Jesus did. Bringing many sons to glory. Or in other words, redeeming. Redeeming mankind. Bringing many men, women into his kingdom. Saving them from the eternal destruction that sin causes. That is something that the Lord Jesus was sent to do. And also to make him the captain of their salvation. So the Lord Jesus has become the chief. You know, captain of a ship is the one who leads the ship. So in the same way, who has led our salvation? Who is the leader of our salvation? It is the Lord Jesus Christ. So he has come to redeem mankind. He has also become the leader or the captain of our salvation. And another beautiful thing that we read in this passage, verse 10 is, perfect through sufferings. So God also felt that Jesus must undergo sufferings. Now it's very um, difficult for us to grasp this. We might ask the question, why is it, Lord, that you wanted Jesus to become a man and suffer for us sins? Could he not have done it in a different way? Or could you not have sent an angel to suffer for us? Why did Jesus suffer? Now, we don't understand the full dynamics of this, but we're told that Jesus, who is the leader or the captain of our salvation, became perfect through sufferings. Okay. Did he need to become perfect? When we study the life of Jesus, we already know that he was sinless. So a person who is so morally correct, how can that person become perfect again? So there is an element of humanness that God wanted in his son, through his son. And when we talk about Jesus becoming perfect, that becoming was through the sufferings that he experienced. So Jesus did not need to become perfect in terms of you know righteousness or doing the right thing. Or being right with God. He was already right with God. But the additional perfection that we're talking about is the experience of humanity that the Lord Jesus had. He suffered as a human being. And that brought perfection to the salvation that he bought for us. And that is why the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now, the verse here starts with, it is fitting. God, why is it fitting for you, for Jesus to go through all this to become the captain of our salvation, to bring many sons to glory? 
we don't understand but that is what god chose for jesus to suffer as a human being and let's continue it says for both he who sanctifies that is jesus sanctify meaning cleansing so the, jesus cleanses us and those who are being sanctified which is us we are being cleansed or cleaned are all of one how are we all one humanity jesus has experienced humanity just like you and me for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren so you know the lord jesus truly expresses humanity in the you know most relatable way we might think after reading hebrews chapter 1 that oh this god he is not approachable he is so great so wonderful how can we relate with him but when you read hebrews chapter 2 you see how god made the lord jesus as man and jesus understood life on earth the pain the sorrow the sufferings and better still we are the same jesus and us you know he says okay we are the same because i too have tasted humanity and because i have tasted humanity it says he is not ashamed to call them brethren isn't that wonderful that the lord jesus is willing to be called as our brother some places when you read this passage you know you have different versions of the bible and um they they try to title sections of chapters uh, so in some versions you would find the title as jesus our elder brother because you know he became the captain of our salvation and he is not ashamed to be called our brother he experienced everything for us and he also won our salvation so jesus is god but here we are told that we have an elder brother who has gone before us and who has uh, uh, experienced life who has conquered sin and satan uh, and here he is he doesn't reject us he calls you he calls me you know brother sister he is not ashamed to call us brother or sister what a what an encouraging thought it is you know that i have an elder brother and that is the lord jesus and so you know as we continue we see here that he uh, the writer is encouraging the persecuted believers and you saying you have somebody who is standing up for you who is representing you and you know he continues and he says that the lord jesus again from the psalms these are all quotes from the psalms you know uh, where the lord jesus declares the people as his brethren and he sings praises in the assembly of god so uh, he is happy to call us his brother or sister and he is also proud you know to uh, have us with him in his team because as he sings before the father in the assembly we read another um, verse here which says here am i and the children whom god has given me so jesus is very proud and happy uh, with us on his team and you know this is truly strengthening for us as believers now let's continue the humanity of jesus that's what we are talking about in hebrews chapter 2 so in verse 14 now we continue to read uh, in as much as the children have partaken of flesh and blood that's very understandable children is people human beings flesh and blood humanity we have put on humanity he himself likewise shared in the same again it's a repetition that jesus also put on flesh and blood or he became a man why earlier we have seen to bring many sons to glory to be perfected through sufferings to taste death on their behalf these are all reasons why he became a human being now we continue he says we are told 
through death he might destroy him who had the power of death okay now in all the things that human beings fear death is one of the key uh, you know i don't know what to call it like the key destruction that comes upon a human being people fear death they fear sickness they fear some form of calamity but ultimately death that's what people fear but we are told here that the lord jesus he has also overcome death he has overcome him who had the power of death who is the him who had the power of death satan now, satan is the one we've already seen in this very passage how god created the world and he gave dominion to man but because of the rebellion of adam and eve the first human beings whom god had created sin came in and the wages of sin is death so mankind started reaping death but then jesus came in the gift of god is eternal life he came in to give us that gift and how did he overcome death to give us eternal life we are told here that he destroyed him who had the power of death so satan was destroyed how was satan destroyed when we go back to passages in the book of colossians we know that the lord jesus colossians chapter 2 that on the cross you know, he made a public spectacle of the enemy triumphing you know on the cross over satan and that is the way in which the lord jesus has destroyed satan who has the power of death so you know it brings great rejoicing to us as we read this passage because there are so many beautiful themes the lord jesus brought us salvation he is not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters and here we are told that the power of death is destroyed satan is destroyed okay so there is so much hope for the believers because the lord jesus is the captain of our salvation so in continuation he he who had the power of death that is the devil and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage so you see because many people fear death fear brings bondage whenever we fear something we can't live free isn't it so that slavery to fear or that bondage to fear was broken off of our lives because of the lord because of what jesus has done that means we can live free uh, and a believer has great hope that even death has been destroyed by the captain of our salvation the lord jesus christ then for indeed he does not give aid to angels but he does give aid to the seed of abraham so once again now it shows us that as believers we have a position of favor in the previous chapter was uh, 14 we saw that angels help us now we are told that the lord jesus helps us what what terms refer to us believers seed of abraham seed of abraham in the book of galatians galatians 3 we see this that we may not be the uh, natural descendants of abraham because we are not you know like from the whole jewish race however by faith we are the descendants of abraham so how do we become the descendants of abraham we become the descendants of abraham through faith so we are the seed of abraham who does god help god sends help or aid not to angels 
in fact it's the other way around the angels are supposed to worship god the angels are supposed to help man and god sends help to the seed of abraham so god has helped us god has uh, you know done all these marvelous things in our lives given us salvation through the lord jesus christ i'm on verse 17 now so in all things he had to be made like his brethren remember we just read that jesus calls mankind brethren and jesus had to be made in every way like brethren mankind why in continuation that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to god so usually a high priest who was chosen to go before god with the affairs of the people he would be a representative of the people you know he would be somebody who understands the people very well only then he could go before god with you know sympathy and uh, empathy meaning it's it's like saying the priest feels the pain or the priest feels the loss or the priest feels the remorse of the people whom he is representing so the priest is so human when he goes before god now for the lord jesus to be a high priest for us or to go to god on behalf of us he needed to sense what we sense experience what we experience and the lord jesus as deity could not have understood what we are going through but when he became became a man you no know, he could understand and sense us for who we are as human beings and that is the reason why the lord jesus had to put on humanity so that he can become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to god also notice to make propitiation for the sins of the people you needed a sacrifice isn't it and uh, you needed a spotless and a blemishless sacrifice uh, and you know again going back by the uh, old testament law you know we know that the lord jesus he completely represented us and we needed somebody like us but without sin to become that sacrifice and that is why he put on humanity and we are also told that the kind of humanity that he experienced you know he suffered in many ways but he also suffered due to temptation suffered being tempted we are told he is able to aid those who are tempted so because he experienced what it feels like you know as a human being there are all kinds of temptations isn't it in this world there's the uh, the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes the pride of life so many things now a lot of people do not believe in the lord jesus not because they doubt his deity but because they doubt his humanity you know if the lord jesus was fully god and had nothing no human element to him then he wouldn't understand our suffering you know he wouldn't understand what we go through as a human beings under temptation scripture is very clear and says yes he was fully god but he was also fully man which is why he suffered in his body he suffered unto death he understands us you know he is a merciful and faithful high priest what more can you ask he doesn't condemn us how did how could you sin like that how could you you know uh, uh, not 
live up you know and even though you're going through crisis how how could you not uh, you know still do the right thing he doesn't condemn and put us down instead you know he uh, uh, he knows what we are going through that is why merciful faithful high priest uh, and he made a pro pro he became the propitiation for our sins and tempted you know uh, now people might say that oh, what does god know you know i live in the 21st century does jesus know uh, what kind of temptations are there in our world today you know as per what scripture tells us it says he suffered being tempted so that in itself is an indicator you know when do you suffer when being tempted let's say for example there is a um, um something that you're not supposed to eat it's not for you but you really like it and it's kept in front of you for hours and hours and hours but you're not supposed to eat it there is a suffering involved because you have to constantly diet your flesh and tell yourself no i can't do this it's not mine i can't do this so there is a suffering when you resist when you don't resist there's no question of suffering you know when uh, one is facing temptation but we are told very clearly here that under life's circumstances no matter what it was he suffered meaning there were many things that he could have given into but he stood up did the right thing did not give in to the pressures of this life you know, go back to um, the time when i think matthew 26 isn't it when he was in the garden of gethsemane where he was tempted like anything i don't want to go on to the cross father if can you take this cup away from me can i do something differently why should i suffer like this why should i die he was tempted and we also read that he resisted isn't it that temptation that he was sweating blood so he suffered all kinds of temptation but here is the great news he overcame so when we go to jesus and when we say i don't think you understand me jesus might have a smile on his face and say i have gone through everything that you are going through right now so i completely understand but i have overcome and i know that even you can overcome you know so that is about the humanity of the lord jesus okay so this passage hebrews chapter 2 is all about the humanity of the lord jesus so i'm just going to pause here um to ask um, if there are any questions uh, in the meantime there is a question here okay yeah so uh prince has a question here which verse is this prince verse 8 okay i just go back to verse 8 okay ah uh, okay so prince we talked about the dominion of uh, the lord jesus christ um uh, uh, sorry the dominion that was given to mankind okay through psalm 8 that's what we understood so verse 8 it says but we do not yet uh, see all things put under him which means to say that yes dominion is given to man uh, but there were some things unfulfilled you know uh, in the authority of man which the lord jesus has fulfilled okay so does that make sense do do you understand that okay great yeah that's nice uh anything else 
maybe your own thoughts if not a question about the humanity of jesus what what do you have to say Okay, so yeah, you could just take all this in, meditate on these scriptures. Um, and as I told you earlier, uh, the believers at that time who were undergoing persecution, they also had this wrong teaching going on where people said that Jesus was fully God, but he was not fully man. Now that is also problematic so that is why the writer of the hebrews he's clarifying this that jesus you know christology what we have all studied that uh, while he is fully god he is also fully man because if he was only god you know there were other theories that people came up with like when he died on the cross he didn't really die because he was after all only god so that death was not a real human death. But look at scripture. He suffered to death. He suffered you know, under temptation. He experienced whatever we experience so that he could become a merciful, faithful high priest. So scriptures clarify time and again this mystery. It is a mystery. How can somebody be fully God? and fully man at the same time but jesus is both fully god and fully man okay so uh, we have that clarity let's uh, go in for a break now it's 9 48 we can come back at 9 58 and continue into the next uh, chapter i hope this is fine everyone are you doing okay are you able to understand Okay, wonderful. Okay, let's, great, great. Thank you. So let's go for a break and we shall be back in 10 minutes.